take five seconds to pause the video, read the question, and then we'll go through the answer. So we have a 57-year-old male with a past medical history of hypertension presenting to his primary care for hoarseness and dyspnea. It's been progressively worsening over the past two months, and the patient has chronic smoking history for as long as he can remember. So, you know, immediately you start to think, what's the number one thing, if this was the only information you had, that you would start to think about? So the number one thing you should be thinking about is lung cancer. Okay, that's the number one thing. The patient has a significant smoking history. They have new onset hoarseness and shortness of breath. He also states he's been having double vision when leaning forward. Now that's interesting because this doesn't completely coincide with lung cancer, at least not initially. But when we do some digging here, this will start to make more sense. During physical examination, auscultation reveals mild and, ex and expiratory wheezing bilaterally over the lung fields. Heart sounds are normal. With a regular rhythm. Radial pulses are two plus and symmetric bilaterally, okay? No thyromegaly is present. Diffuse venous distension, this is really important. Diffuse venous distension is observed in the neck and chest wall. Edema is present diffusely throughout the upper extremities. Fundoscopic examination reveals papal edema bilaterally. So, you know, we can put together the papal edema with the double vision when leaning forward. We can associate this with increases in intracranial pressure. We talked a lot about that in the neurology videos. Chest radiography is performed. A suspicious mass is highlighted on imaging. Okay, so here we can see this thing right here is most likely the suspicious mass that we're referring to. Okay, and you know what's interesting here? Look at the lung fields. Okay, so the lung fields really don't show any signs of pulmonary edema, no pleural effusions, sharp costophrenic angles. Okay, so very kind of clean lung fields other than this mass that we're seeing here. So which embryologic derivatives are most closely associated with the structure compressed in this patient? So what's really happening with this patient? So we have a patient here that it looks like they have lung cancer, possibly a bronchogenic carcinoma as it's a little you know, further distal down here, but we're not really sure. We'd have to go in and, and get a biopsy, but we have some suspicious mass here that's leading to some really interesting findings. The patient has diffuse venous distension observed in the neck and chest wall, edema in the upper extremities, and they have in, uh, signs of increased intracranial pressure. Now, can you think of a structure that you would compress that would cause all of this? Well, it's gonna be because there's such kind of vast findings, right? It's not localized to one arm. If it was just one arm, maybe it's a brachiocephalic vein, for example. But, or if it's just in the, you know, if there's just increased intracranial pressure, maybe it's in, in a jugular vein. But the fact that I have all of these findings, right, anatomically, it's gonna to have to be a more proximal structure. How about the superior vena cava, right? If I compress the superior vena cava, what's gonna happen? Well, I'm going to get a backup of blood going back up through the jugular veins and through the brachiocephalic veins. That's gonna to lead to edema in the extremities increases in intracranial pressure, right? We talked about cerebrospinal fluid eventually draining into the arachnoid granulations and into the venous system. And if that gets backed up, that's gonna cause increases in intracranial pressure, even potentially a hydrocephalus if it gets severe. Okay, and so that's where we're getting the papal edema from. That's where we're getting the edema, the diffuse venous distension. We're compressing the superior vena cava from this mass and it's progressively worsening. And again, now the question is, what is the embryologic derivative of the superior vena cava? Is it the truncus arteriosus? Remember the truncus arteriosus? Remember you're thinking about your persistent truncus arteriosus. What are the two structures involved with that? You have the aorta and you have the pulmonary trunk. Okay, and you might be saying, well, what about if I compress the aorta? Well, just remember the aorta is not really in this region of where the mass is, but let's just say that, you know, you try to make a case for that. The fact that, you know, if you had coarctation or if you had compression of the aorta, which is very difficult by the way, because the aorta has very, very high pressures. But if you did, you would have some discrepancy usually in your pulses here, okay? And they'll, or they'll give you something to kind of suggest that. The fact that the lungs are clear, right? If I had a compression of my aorta or stenosis there, I would have back above that blood flow that would hit the lungs before it would hit these other structures like the uh, extremities and the, the brain and, ice and the intracranial pressure increases we see. So the lungs are clear, so that it would suggest against pulmonary trunk or the aorta potentially being involved. 
Endocardial cushions, these are classically associated with valvular disease or potentially like a ventricular septal defect. But remember, there's really no murmurs and there's no other abnormalities mentioned in terms of heart sounds. So this would seem unlikely. And the right sixth pharyngeal arch, this is classically going to be associated with the right proximal pulmonary artery. And again, this is really not consistent with the location of the mass. It seems much more likely that this would probably be affecting the superior vena cava and the left fourth pharyngeal arch. Remember, this is also going to be associated with um, the aorta as well. And again, we don't really have any uh, discrepancies in the pulses, the lungs are clear, there's no murmur, there's no rib notching or collateral circulation um, that I can see on the imaging. And so for those reasons, it seems most likely that the superior vena cava would probably be involved. And this is actually a syndrome that I would say is medium low yield superior vena cava syndrome, okay, which typically happens because of pancos tumors or certain kinds of masses, or even central venous catheters can actually cause clots or lesions in this area. Again, superior vena cava comes from the cardinal veins. That was one of the big three that we wanted to remember uh, from that section.